thing, and I was watching Wally, and just a thought come to my mind as I was listening to Kaylee sing and watching Wally and stuff, and you know, and I was telling Teresa there last week, I said, you know, it's boring sitting here at home not doing nothing. I mean, Sunday morning we didn't have church, and Sunday night we didn't have church, and I'm going to tell you what, that made an awfully long day. Yes. Amen. And it just dragged and dragged and dragged. But, you know, as I was thinking about that a few moments ago, and I know there's a lot of people who don't like to hear it, but I'm going to say it. A lot of us say, let's not this church, it's everywhere. They always say, well, it's, I don't have to go to church. I can just sit here at home. Let me tell you something. You have to go to church. Amen. You have to. Yes. If you're feeling good, I don't care if you're sick. You need to be trying to be in church. Amen. It's a must. It, a lot of people, oh no, I don't have to do that. You know, I can, I can sit here and I can serve God. Sit, no, you can't. What do you? What did you guys do when you were sitting home these past couple Sundays? Now, come on, be honest. I went to Jimmy Spiker's church. Well, yeah, you, you did. But I'm saying, a lot of us be honest here. What did we do? Because a lot, of, a lot of these ones that say they stay home, they don't have to be in church. Now, what did they do? What did we do? Did they literally sit down and read this work? Did they literally pick it up and read it? Did they literally pray? I don't think so. They didn't. And then when I was looking at Wally, I, I was thinking about, this is not my message, but this is just a little preview here. And I was thinking about the time we went through the land of Georgia. And I was thinking about all the homeless people in the land of Georgia underneath the bridges. And the Spirit of the Lord just spoke to me and said, These people that don't go to church, we have a bunch of homeless Christians. That's right. That's right. Amen. And we live in a society today that we have homeless Christians. I don't have to go to church. Now, if you don't have to go to church, let me, you, you just think about a homeless person. What do they do? When they're, they're out there on the street, now come on, Wally, you know, they're out there on the street begging for food, right? Okay, if they're out there on the street begging for food, now, how are you going to get fed if you're not in church? Amen. Right. You're a homeless Christian. Amen. Amen. And if a homeless person is out there on the street, they're trying to keep warm, right? This is where I come to get warm. This is where I come to get my soul refreshing. Yeah. But a lot of people says, I don't have to go to church. That's right. And it, what, what it is, is a bunch of baloney is what it is. You, you know, we live in a world of phony baloney. And I'm going to tell you what, I feel good being in church tonight. Amen. Amen. And I don't know if I'm going to get this message out tonight or not. But this is just the kind of society we live in today. And they wonder why everything is all out of whack in our life. Because they are a, quote, homeless Christian. I mean, and I, and I was thinking about other stuff that I was reading here in the past few weeks here. Uh... A lot of people look at this, uh, judge ye not, lest ye be judged. They always use that for an excuse for everything. And I thought to myself, how in the world, I'm going to use us, how in the world, 
The Christians in the church going to judge somebody when they don't even let God's word even judge them. That's right. How are we going to change your mind by what we say when they don't even let the word of God change them? That's right. And you know what it is? Lots of times to waste the time. And you know, they take this word and they twist it. They take it and twist it to their benefit. That's right. To fit them so they don't have to do nothing. Well, I'm going to tell you what. A lot of people look at that verse. I, I look at that. I might be wrong. But I'm going to tell you what. That's a commandment. And I was sharing this with Dad here a week ago. That verse doesn't say that I can't judge. It says that I can judge. Yes. That's right. It says that I can judge. But first of all, I've got to get the log out of my own eye uh -huh. first. If I don't get the log out of my own eye, I can't take the speck out of my brother's eye. Right. But it says I can judge. But we flip it all around. That's right. You can't judge me. <laughs> Only God can judge. Yes, God can judge you. I have no doubts. He will. But if we look at that, God judges us to make us perfect in His sight. He wants us perfect. Because, you know, God wants us perfect because if we read the Bible, one of these days, us as a church... He's going to judge us when we die. Okay? But when we make it to heaven, but later on, He's going to give us the power to judge angels. That's right. That's right. Amen. And I was telling Melissa, like I said, this is a freebie record. But if, if, if God gives us the power and authority to judge angels later, That makes us higher than angels. Right. Ain't that good? Amen. Amen. But that's not what I'm going to preach on. <laughs> but as as the weeks, a couple weeks here went by, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm going to try to get this out tonight. But I hear it's. One of the big phrases, quote, Christian people will use. And everybody uses it now. Just a few simple words. God knows my heart. <laughs> I get so sick and tired of hearing, God knows my heart. Yes, he does. But I'm, I'm going to give you an example why people... Use that phrase. God knows my heart. They use that phrase because they want to use that excuse as a way they live. Well, God knows my heart. That's right. Now, I'm going to get into this. Turn to Hebrews 4 and 12. I've read this verse before, time and time again, but I will tell you what, I really, really looked at this first past couple weeks. Probably the past four weeks, I'm going to say. But Hebrews 4 and 12 says this. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, 
And it's a deserter of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now, what I re really like about this, I was thinking about, do you guys remember being in science class in school? You remember that, Andy? That's a long time. Long time, but do you remember? I remember being in science class. And the teacher said, well, come next week. You're going to dissect. And I thought, what in the world are, are you talking about? Because I had no idea what he was talking about. But he said, come next week. You bring some bags and stuff in. We're going to dissect some frogs. What am I going to do? I, I didn't know what he was talking about. But if you look up the word dissect, it says methodically cut up in order to study the internal parts. So he gave me a partner. And we took that frog and he gave us a scabble. I think it was. And we cut that frog open and he wanted us to dissect it to see what it was made of. To see the internal parts of it. And if you know me all my life, I don't like blood. I didn't like the thoughts of dissecting that frog to see what was in there. But as, as I was just thinking about the word dissect, and in science class when I had to dissect that frog. And, and if you look at this first, It says it'll divide. It'll divide the soul and spirit. So the word tells me that it's going to dissect you. That's right. So if the word dissects you, you know, lots of times we think, oh, the preacher don't know me. He don't know me from, from Peter, from Paul. Well, maybe he does. But the Bible says here, a two-headed sword piercing even the biting of the center of the soul and spirit and of the joints and the mar, and it is a discerner. Let me tell you something. If you think you can fool the preacher, you ain't going to do it. That's right. If he's in God, you're not going to fool the preacher. But if you fool the preacher, you're not going to fool God. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So you can go from here, point A to point B. You can fool the preacher over here, point A. But point B, which is God, you're not going to fool him. Amen. Because he deserves you. He knows you. He knows you personally. And it, the word says, deserter of the thoughts. He knows your every thought. That's right. Yes. You might have a thought in your mind, and you might think that you're going to fool God, but you're not. Because yeah. a word... God says, I discern you. Mm -hmm. I know you. I made you. Amen. That's pretty deep right there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And it says, the intents of the heart. He knows your intents. Oh, God knows my intents. Yes, he does. Amen. Yes, he does. He knows your thoughts. He knows if you're lying. He knows everything about you. You can't get away from it. And you know what? I was thinking about this too. And I'm just going to use me and Melissa. We have so many 
things that we use. The Word says God knows your intent. And I thought about me and Melissa as a married couple. And probably Jimmy and Teresa feels the same way about this. You know what? If Melissa decides five years down the road, she no longer wants to serve God. She no longer wants to sing for God. She no longer wants to go to church. That doesn't have to affect me. That's right. Amen. One shape or form, that doesn't have to affect me. And a lot of people use that. Well, my, my spouse don't do it, so I'm not going to do it. He don't go, I'm not going to go. But I thought, now come on. Most American people, or American families, they have two vehicles in the family. Now, why should that hinder you from doing the work of God? It's right. It shouldn't. And I thought, if Melissa quit, I'm going to keep on going. If she don't want to follow me, that's fine. I'm going to do it. We say, God knows the intents of our hearts. And I thought about the word intent. You know, <clears throat> we take murderers and stuff on the street. When they do that, they're judged. They, they're set before a judge, right? And they ask them questions about it. What, what was your motive? Why did you do it? What was the intent in your heart? You know, God is doing the same thing to us now. Amen. He's judging us. He's putting, that, putting us on that seat and asking us, what, why, what, what is your intent? Why are you not doing this? Why are you living loosely? And I thought about this. And then I'm going to use Jimmy's example. As, as my title of my message is, God Knows My Heart. Jimmy, I want you to do something tomorrow morning. Jimmy works up there for five minutes. I don't know what vehicle he drives to work tomorrow morning. But take that white truck tomorrow morning. You take that to work. And he goes through Star City. <laughs> when you see that cop sitting up there next to the Texas Roadhouse, before you get to that cop, I want you to step on the gas. <laughs> Go ahead, Jimmy, just step on that gas. All right? And when you step on that gas, I think the speed limit in Star City might be 40 miles an hour. But I want, Jimmy, I want you to go 80 miles an hour through there. And I want you to pass that cop up. And I'm sure that cop's going to pull you off the road and he's going to give you a ticket. But as soon as that cop pulls up behind you and you roll your window down, and he says, Sir, do you know you were speeding? And your reply is going to be, Well, officer, you know my heart. <laughs> now, I'm going to use that example. If Jimmy was doing this tomorrow, and he told the officer, Well, officer, you know my heart. Now, you think Jimmy's going to get out of that ticket. <laughs> But here as church folk, the cop won't take that excuse. But we take that excuse and we give out to God. Well, God, you know my heart. That's hogwash. <laughs> Plain out hogwash. But I wrote down here, It, it is. It's definitely the number.
number one Christian, Christian catchphrase. God knows my heart. And often, I wrote down, often used when knowing we ourselves are not living close as we should. So we use that. Then justifying ourselves before God and before other people. Well, Montaigne, I know I ain't been to church for a year. God bless you, Montaigne, but you know my heart. But I wrote down, at the same time, refusing to hear God's servant. But God, you know my heart. Dad, I don't want to listen to you. And Jimmy, I don't want to listen to your preaching. And Teresa, I don't want to listen to your preaching. But praise be to God, He knows my heart. <laughs> Speaking against God's children. Well, Annie, I'm so sorry I talked about you the other day. I really didn't mean to. It was just my human flesh. It got in the, it just got in the way, Annie. But you know, God knows my heart. <laughs> Smiting God's children and sowing dis discord. Come to the church. We come to the church just to tear the church up. See if we can cause friction. Yes. See if we can tear it up. See if we can get the church in discord. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, you know my heart. <laughs> <laughs> Number four. Putting the cares of this world before God. We always do that. Putting the cares of this world before God. And I thought about this. Sometimes we do things backwards. And I'm just going to use this as an example. Pastor? Oh, you know, I ain't been to church for a while, but I can't help it. We call him on the phone. Oh. I just bought these cattle and I bought these 50 head of cattle, Pastor. And, uh, I got to build a fence. I got to build a fence so I can keep them in. Did it take you two years to build that fence? <laughs> Where you been? I ain't seen you. But then we say, well, God knows my heart. But then I was thinking about this. I'm going to give you another example. Lots of times we need something from God, right? And sometimes it's very urgent. And we need it now. And I was thinking about that, that uh, commercial on TV. J.D. Wentworth. It's my money and I want it now. That's the way we are with God. We come to God, asking God to help us. But God, you know, I need this blessing now. But we use that all the time. Past six months, a year, well, God knows my heart hurt. But, well, I guess God's not going to answer me. But, we always expect God to answer now. We do. But then, other times, we go along, we don't even think nothing of it. It might be weeks, it might be months, and we don't, we don't even think nothing of it. And I was thinking about God.
God is always there to help us and answer our prayers and needs, right? I wonder if God... I wonder if God had a, a telephone. Oh, my. And wonder if God had an answer machine. Like we do. And we pray. And we need something. But he, it seems like he doesn't answer. But, but literally, if he had a phone and we called him up. Well, God, you know, I've prayed for a couple days and you just had answered my prayer. I haven't heard from you, God. And it rings about five, six times. And God says, Beep, you hear that beep on that answer machine. Well, if you have a message, just leave your name and number, and I'll get back to you. Sorry, I'm in the Bahamas for two weeks. I'm on vacation. I'll get to you when I get back. But you see, God is not like that. But we are. But then we use the catchphrase. God knows my heart. But number five. Double tongued. Say one thing and do another. Well. I can use myself as an example. I'm going to tell you, Pastor, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to be here for you. I'm going to be here to help you out. Whatever you need, Pastor, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here to preach. I'm going to be here to play music. I'm going to have your back, Pastor. <laughs> Where are you at? Then a couple weeks later, sorry, Pastor. Oh, this has happened, that's happened, but Lord, Pastor, you know my heart. <laughs> then, you know, this is the way it the society is today. And in closing, hey, come up here tonight. I'm going to use you. Stand up there. why God was dealing with me about this this hogwash people use. Now, if you read in Luke chapter 18 and 25 says, For it is easier for a camel to go through a eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Alright? But we want to use that phrase God, you know my heart. Now, a lot of Christian people look at as literally being a rich man. It's not. I'm a rich man. I am. I'm blessed. God has blessed me. He saved my soul. So, that verse is talking about me. I'm the rich man, right? But it says right here, it's easier. Now everybody see this, this needle in my hand right here? This is bigger than any ordinary needle right here. But it's still small yet. Now I'm going to use Faith tonight because she's been playing basketball. She's getting, she's getting pretty athletic now. Running up and down the court and stuff. So like I said, a lot of people use that phrase, well, Lord, you know my heart. 
Well, it says it's easier right here. Faith, I'm gonna hold that. I'm gonna hold that needle up. You jump through that needle. <laughs> you tell me how easy it is. Well, can you can you do it? You can't. Well, the word says it. It says it's easier right there. I mean, there everybody says it. Can you stick it in? Stick your head in there. Can't. Why? Help me out of here. <laughs> well, if you can't do that, stick your arm in there. <laughs> can't do that either, right? No? Yeah. All right. Well, let me see your pinky. Yeah. Stick your pinky. Well, it won't fit either. <laughs> Boy, that's pretty hard trying to stick something through that needle. But, again, you can go sit down. Thank you. Again, but people want to use that phrase. Well, God knows my heart. Which brought me to another thing here. When our life is over and our work is done on earth, God is either going to say, Depart from me, I know you not. Or enter into the joy of the Lord. Now, if the word says it's easier, for it is easier for a camel to go through a needle, needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, I tried it. It didn't work. Now, common sense says if you look at faith, faith is smaller than a camel. Now, I ain't no genius, but I, I think a camel weighs at least 1,500 to 2,000 pounds, right? So, faith can't go through. A camel can't go through. But church people want to use this phrase. There's something wrong. <laughs> There's something wrong with that picture. But tonight, as I close, as Melissa comes back up, but that's what God was dealing with me for the past couple of weeks. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you what, oh man, did it, I just kept, I just kept on thinking about it, thinking about it. I thought, why? why? Why can't we come up with something else besides this? You know why? I'll tell you why. Because like I said, it makes, them, it makes them feel good and all mushy inside. It, it, makes, their, it makes their human, you know, it, it's, it's soothed. It soothes their soul. That's what it does. Well, I'm going to tell, tell you what. I'm not buying it. And I'm going to tell you what. That way of thinking right there, I, I think it's going to send people straight to hell. Because the bottom line is, they're fooling themselves. And if, if, if we go to another verse in the Bible that says, I'd rather have you hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out. Amen. He's going to spit you out. Now I'm going to tell you what, this past summer, when it was hot outside, sometimes I, I, keep, I keep bottles of water in my truck. And it must have been 85, 90 degrees. And Jimmy probably knows what I'm talking about when you're out there and you're thirsty. And I took that bottle of water and I opened it up and I drank that water. And I'm going to tell you what, that water being that hot, that lukewarm, it was the nast nastiest water ever, ever, ever put in my mouth. And no wonder God says if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out. Church, he's not going to mess with us. 
And, you know, sometimes we don't take stuff as serious as we should. Amen. And like I said in the beginning, I may not fool the pastor, and I may not fool the church. I may fool the church that I'm going to. And the, and the pastor, and whoever. But you know what? I don't want to fool nobody. I want to make sure that I know. I want to make sure that I know that I'm right. Amen. And, you know, I'm... I'm going to close here in a second. But I was, I was thinking about I was thinking about mom this morning. I, I can even use you, mom, thank you. And, and several other women in here. I thank you for being faithful to God. I do. And I thank for the men in here that's faithful to God. The men and women. But mom sick as she's been the last year and a half or two years. She's had every excuse in the book to use the phrase that I just preached on tonight. Well, God knows my heart. But she doesn't. Her heart is the bee in this house. No matter if she struggles with something, no matter how much pain she's in, she knows that she needs to be here. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you what, Mom. And uh, Teresa and Dad probably agrees with me. I want to act at the same attributes as my mom has. She has perseverance. Nothing ever stops her. She has faith. She loves God. I know that for sure. Because she's here tonight. And you, you know what it boils down to. We have that love for God. If we have, honestly have love for God. We want to serve God fully. That's right. Not half-heartedly. And you know, tonight as I close, go ahead and start playing with this before I keep on preaching. <laughs> but uh, as you come up tonight, I don't know what your need is tonight, but God does. <laughs>